Mark uh, chapter 5, starting to read at verse 21. Uh, just before I read, let me pray. Father, um, address us now, please, as we come to your word. Give us open hearts. Give us wills that obey you. And I pray we might marvel at your mighty deeds. Amen. Amen. So that's page 1007. Uh, Mark chapter 5, starting to read at verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus... She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around to the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who'd done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering." While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jairus, uh, when they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he'd put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to tell anyone about this, and he told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Death hurts so much, doesn't it? It isn't that it's unexpected. We will all die, but it is intensely painful. You could argue, I suppose, that unexpected death is unexpectedly painful. But I don't think the knowledge that someone will die in any way diminishes the intense pain of bereavement. 
There is a wrongness about death, an affront that somebody who we knew and loved and who was so full of life is no longer. One of the emotions that grieving people have is is a sense of anger. Why is this so? It should not be. One of the um, the things you get told, isn't it, when you're when you're grieving, is you'll come to terms with this. We don't want to come to terms with death. Death is an enemy. We we want, in the words of Dylan, Dylan Thomas, to rage against the dying of the light. But the truth is, the light still dies. Illness is another thing which is consistently with us, consistently frustrates us. The world has been frustrated by COVID. And it still creeps up and clobbers us when we're not expecting it, when we have no idea it's happening. We wouldn't have to go very far through this congregation to find plans that have been changed or ruined by sickness. Not being able to shake off a cough from what seems like months ago. Some of you here living with chronic pain. I was chatting with a lady just this week, and for all of the skill of her doctors, for all of the pills that she's on, she is unable to lie down and go to sleep. She has to catnap sitting up in her chair. Jesus is going to demonstrate his power over two of our greatest foes, two of the things which we cannot control for all of the skill and the care and the concern of our doctors, two things which leave us impotent and angry. This true story from the Bible shows us two problems the world cannot solve. Two problems the world cannot solve, death and chronic illness. Have a look down, please, at verse 22. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. Uh, And then on to verse 39. Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. The, The reason of the commotion, the reason for the wailing is that they knew she was dead death. We we just can't stop it. And then there's chronic sickness. Verse 25, a woman who was there who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Both Jairus and this lady are hopeless cases. I grant you in the case of, of Jairus, there may have been hope at the beginning, but by the end, by verse 35, everyone knows Death has won, and another loved one has gone too soon. Death is the end. Even even now for us, death is the end. With machines, with intensive cares, with hospitals, with, with drugs that can seemingly do the impossible, in the end, we all die. And there's nothing more to do but to mourn. Uh, And chronic illness. Uh, I mentioned the lady I I was speaking to, but we could go through this congregation. We could talk to people here. You could chat with people over a cup of coffee. And it's quite hard to avoid the organ recital. How are you? Oh, my back. (laughs) How are you? Yeah, I've got a funny shoulder. How are you? I've just been dropped in some water and left there for quite a long time by David and David. (laughs) We could go through the congregation and come up with 
all the things, all the niggles, all the illness. You might have heard the expression that the the cure is worse than the sickness. Well, for this lady, there has been no cure, and the cure she's been subjected to is hideous. Verse 26, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. No one can help her. There is no treatment that money can buy that will improve this lady's condition. She's in huge trouble. And once again, we see Jesus' love for suffering people. He heals or saves both of them. Two problems the world cannot deal with. And then we meet two people who are battling with faith. They're battling to put their trust in Jesus, to believe in his goodness and to trust in his power. Have a look at verse 28, please. Here's the lady. If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. I quite like a neat and tidy explanation to have things explained. So to understand why this this woman who is bleeding, why she thought that just by touching Jesus, she would be healed. But she does and she is and verse 27 i think gives us a lovely little snapshot of what faith is she heard about jesus verse 27 and what she heard about him made her want to come to him so she came to him and what she had heard and what she had seen about him made her act in such a way that she expressed her dependence on him she reached out her hand to touch his cloak and she was healed 12 years of shame of frustration of pain of separation healed with one touch we are supposed to ask the question who can do that who can do that but it's Jesus who asks a question Uh, He asks a question which rather frustrates his disciples. He says, who touched my clothes? End of verse 30. (laughs) And they say, verse 31, everyone, everyone touch your clothes. We're in the middle of a crowd. People are piling all around you. Don't be daft, Jesus. Everyone is touching your clothes. Why are you obsessing with this? This synagogue leader's, you know, child is in trouble. We've got to get there. But Jesus knew that someone had reached out in faith and touched his cloak. And he didn't want to let that person go without knowing them, without acknowledging them. Verses uh, verses 32 and 33. She's trembling. She is afraid. She knows that actually by being in that crowd... Uh, By touching Jesus, uh, she has made all of them, all of the people who she's touched, uh, unfit to be with God under Jewish law. But instead of a rebuke, she hears these lovely words from Jesus. Daughter, he calls her, you are part of the family. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Jesus is so compassionate. He takes an impersonal encounter and he turns it into a personal blessing. Wouldn't you want to know someone like that? Now, if the, if the lady has struggled with faith, Jairus is in a real pickle, isn't he? Because disaster of disasters It appears that even as Jesus has been speaking with this woman, it is now too late for Jairus' daughter. There may have been a glimmer of hope while Jesus was walking towards the house, and he stops, and it's all gone. 
because news comes in verse 36. Why bother the teacher anymore? Your daughter is dead. And Jesus says these extraordinary words. Don't be afraid, just believe. Of course Jairus is going to be afraid. He's going to be afraid of what he's going to say to his wife. He's going to be afraid of how he will comfort her, how he will live. He's going to be afraid of standing up in the synagogue and, and, and breaking down in tears as he thinks of the death of his daughter. He's going to be afraid that he'll never be able to go to another, another wedding party in the village. And Jesus says, don't be afraid, trust me. This situation is grim, but trust me. And it's an outrageous thing for someone to say to a man who's just been told their daughter is dead. But Jesus does say it. And the question is, can he deliver? Yes, he can, because two lives are immediately restored. Do you see that word? Mark likes it, uh, but it's very, very striking. Immediately, immediately. Verse 29. Look down, please, if you've got that passage open. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Just like that. The touch of Jesus, uh, and she is immediately healed. Verse 41. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, she stood up and walked around. Jairus and the woman have one thing in common. They are both victims of desperate situations with no hope apart from Jesus. They're both people whom the world cannot help, but Jesus can and Jesus does. With a word, with actually two words, Jesus brings this girl back to life. It isn't, um, it isn't as if... Uh, <coughs> Uh, it, it isn't as if she sort of begins to groggily go, oh, 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 I think I'm feeling a bit better now. No, Jesus reaches down into death, takes the hand of a dead girl, and says to her, get up. And she does. It is easier for Jesus to wake this 12-year-old girl up from death than it is for you to get up on Monday morning and go to work. <laughs> what kind of a man can do that? Immediately the woman is healed, the dead girl lives. What kind of power is that? Do you think of Jesus like that? Being a, this powerful? This good? Two things strike me about this story, and both of them are how people respond to Jesus. The first is, no one suggests that the woman, that, that the girl, sorry, isn't dead. No one denies that a miracle has taken place. Nobody says, ah, oh, Jesus, you were right. Sorry, she was sleeping. My mistake. And you just went over and gave her a jolly good pinch. And that startled her, and now look, here she is. She's always been a heavy sleeper. She's like her mother. No one says that. My friends, we are dealing with the power of God. What do you make of it? I'm quite happy if you say, well, I can't believe it, or I've never heard anything about it. But, but you mustn't just dismiss it out of hand, because it doesn't fit into the neat box of your worldview. Well, if you do do that, then you're only doing that against all the evidence. The second thing is that no one is indifferent to Jesus, are they? I mean, some people mock him. Some people think this is the voice of a madman when Jesus says, you know, she's only asleep and I'm going to wake her up. The professional mourners, the people who went from funeral to funeral, they're the, they're the funeral directors of the modern day, uh, of, the, of the ancient world. They're the funeral directors of the ancient world, and they provide a soundtrack of mourning and lament uh, to the funeral. They're thinking, Jesus, 
We know a dead body when we see one. And you're wrong. She is not asleep. And so they laugh at him, don't they? Verse 39, have a look down, please. The child is not dead but asleep. Verse 40, they laugh at him. Jesus, your, your sandwich is short of a picnic. You're, you're living in denial. She's dead. We know she's dead. That's one response. If you've been breathing any length of time in the world, you'll know people find it easy to mock Jesus. Well, they did then. Even in the face of astonishing miracles, they found it easy to mock him. But the other response is of complete wonder and amazement. Verse 42. End of the verse there. At this... They were completely astonished. Well, you would be, wouldn't you? Saw a dead girl stand up, go to the fridge and, you know, have a fridge raider or two to perk her up. You would be surprised, I think. And so should we be. We should be slack-jawed in wonder. We should be asking, who is this who can do this? But what no one said was, oh, that's nice. Oh, I'm pleased for you. Oh, that must be a real comfort. Wow, yeah, no. Mm. Oh, how lovely for you. The very nature of Jesus is he rules out any indifference. If you've been here the last couple of weeks, we've seen Jesus in control of, of fearsome storms, of of powerful evil of, well, horrific sickness of death itself. How do you respond to a man like that? Slack, jawed amazement is the right response. You see, in the face of our two most terrifying realities, Jesus can be trusted to see us through. I, I actually have some sympathy with those who faced with the outrageous words of Jesus laughed laugh almost in embarrassment because we know that when you're dead you're dead well not if you're with Jesus and the experience of Jairus's daughter ought to convince us of that Jesus isn't every day he's not run of the mill he isn't one of a number of sort of you know like brands of toothpaste Oh, well, which one shall I go for? Well, this spiritual leader looks nice. Jesus, he, he looks nice. Well, yeah, he might be worth checking out. See, lots of people like some of the things Jesus says. They love the stuff about loving your neighbor, about getting involved in your community. They love all that. But not many of them, when faced with the power of God, respond with wide-eyed wonder. How will you respond to the one who can heal the sick and who can raise the dead? With astonishment that leads to worship or with mirth at some barely believable claims? Well, we've heard from Ollie. We've heard from Jeremy, haven't we? They've had a good long look at the evidence. And they've come to the conclusion that Jesus is who he claims to be, the Son of God. They've asked him to forgive them. They've put their lives into his hands. They have recognized that he is good and powerful. What's stopping you from doing the same? Let me pray. Oh Lord, in a world where we are cynical and often weary, I pray we may look in slack-jawed wonder at Jesus, the Son of God, who can do what only God can do, and that we may worship him. Amen.